This evening's discussion, shall we? All right. So on the screen here, this is what we're going to look at right here. All right. So Philippians chapter two. Now, prior to these verses here, we see Paul, just showing you on the screen here, blue letter Bible. You guys check it out. Paul states here, he's writing to the Philippians and he says, and therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, there's any fellowship of the spirit, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. So he's writing to these Christians who are in Philippi. He's wanting this unity, the same mind, same intent, being together in purpose, right? He says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So the reason why this is important is because Paul is laying out here the purpose. And when we look at verse 5, when it says, therefore, Goes on to say, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. What attitude did Jesus actually have? What attitude did Jesus have for mankind? Did he love mankind? Did he have a choice? Was it something he was forced to believe, right? This is something we believe he done voluntarily. Something out of humility, right? So Paul is saying here, do nothing from selfishness. Empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. So now, when we get to these verses here, and this is the key right here. This is the key, but a lot of times people miss this key note here. Have this attitude, mind. In yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. What attitude did Jesus have? How was what Paul is conveying here of this humility that he was talking about before, putting other people first, right? This is what he's saying over here in verses two and three. He says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard another one another as more important than yourselves. That's something we all struggle with, right? Something we're all still trying to work on, right? We're supposed to be Christians. What does the word Christian mean? The simplest explanation, the way to find that word, of what it literally means is Christ-like, right? One who follows the teachings, who is a follower of Christ and is following his example. So how are we supposed to be following Jesus? Well, Paul gives us a good demonstration here. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. So what kind of others' interest did, did Jesus have that Paul is going to talk about here? Have this attitude in yourselves, which also, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, some people, which is just hilarious. I use the word hilarious in the nicest way possible. I'll just say it's actually absolutely ridiculous. How about that? Let's just remember the I put up my picture recently. Which Kelly do you want? I'm going to be Galatians 4.16 tonight. I'm going to be Galatians 4.16 tonight. Okay. I'm going to tell you the truth. Those who think that the humility they will claim as Unitarians, that the humility that Jesus had is that as a man, when God called him and was choosing him to now be the Messiah and choosing him now to be the son of God, 
that Jesus somehow had humility as a man to humble himself to follow what the Father was calling him to do. So how can you already, as a man, humble yourself to be a man? How can you, already born as a man, humble yourself as a man? As once a famous face from a very popular actor back in the day, some of you may recognize. You cannot humble yourself as a man if you are already born as a man. It doesn't make any sense, right? It's ridiculous. So Paul is giving us some information here. He's laying it out because Jesus pre-existed. Jesus pre-existed, okay? Actually, that was, I believe, from um, National Lampoon's Vacation, I think, Kelby. Um, so have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now we see what Paul is saying here. So the attitude that, Paul, that Jesus has is what? These particular three verses right here. This is the focus. This is the focus of the incarnation right here, okay? This is the focus. So have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, who's that? Jesus, although he existed, this is talking about something that was already in existence. He was already being, that's another way it can be translated, being, he being in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. So who, meaning Jesus, although he existed, so he was already in the existence in the form of a God, in form of God, not a God, in form of God, right? Who, although he existed in the form of God, Jesus goes, says here, Paul, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay, here was it. Where's this attitude we're seeing from Jesus here? But emptied himself, taking, taking, taking the form of a bond servant. And being made in the likeness of men. This is talking about Jesus coming in this world and becoming a man, taking on our likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death. On a cross. So when you read these verses, and Paul says once again, have this attitude or mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed, meaning prior to his incarnation, prior to taking on flesh, he existed in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. We're going to look at these words, so don't worry. Emptied himself. Another way that, that can also be translated, humbled himself. Taking the form of a bond servant, being made and like his men. So we see two places here. First, he humbled himself or emptied himself, taking the form of, of a bond servant. We'll look at that in just a second. Secondly, as being now as a man, he humbled himself also to the point of death on the cross. That he died for you, for me, 
for your neighbors, for your friends, for the people around you, everyone. Hebrews 2, 9 says that Christ tasted death for everyone. That is the gospel. So we see here who, although he exists in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. If you've noticed, I've read this over about three times now. And very importantly, of why. Because I'm wanting you to see and not just pick a word here, stop here. So many groups do. They'll pick a word here, stop there, and they don't see the whole package. You read all of that together. And when you're studying it, which I'm going to go through this evening or morning or afternoon or Happy New Year, whatever time it is for you, inductively, we're going to look at some words. We're going to look about what's going on, why this matters, who's being addressed. And then lastly, towards the end, how this all applies. Okay. So let's look at a few things together. All right. All right. So we're going to look at the word here. And we're going to talk about here, let's get to it here. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Dun, dun, dun. Why are you not showing up over here for me? Where are you? You're supposed to be here. Why am I not seeing you? I have my own notes up here, and for some reason, I am not seeing the reason why I had this up here. Oh, there it is. Okay. There we go. Sorry. I had to just find where I'm looking at here. That way you guys can see it. Okay. All right. So let's put this on the screen for you guys to see. Okay. All right. So this is the word uh, in Philippians 2.6. Or the word here, who is, um, we'll pronounce it here. Strong's G, 5225. Huparcho. 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 Right? So here, this is the word that we're seeing here for the word being. Right? The word being or existed. Right? And this has various ways this can be understood. It can have the meaning to begin. Below, to make a beginning, to begin, to come forth, hence, to be there, be ready, be at hand, to be. Huparko, to begin, under, come into existence. These are different ways to be understood. Explicitly, to exist, to exist, after, behave, live. So these are different ways, right? Here, then, it gives into the Thayer's Greek lexicon. And as you scroll through this, I want to get down to where I had it highlighted here. So here talks about in to be in the form of God, Philippians 2 6. So this is where it's being highlighted. Being originally, right? Being originally. So to be in the form of God, being originally in the form of God. To be in the form of God, Philippians 2 6, being originally. And if you scroll back up, what's going on here is to be, to be. This is talking about who Jesus was prior to his incarnation, to be. So Philippians 2, 6, to be in the form of God, Philippians 2, 6, and being originally. So originally, Jesus was in the form of God prior to his, his incarnation. Now, why is that important? Well, let's look at another word here. This is over here for the word um, form. This is the word, we see the word nature. Has the word nature, right? And here, we'll see here, so it talks about Philippians 
two six and also seven, but two six here, right? This is the whole passage here. What are you doing? Why are you being this way? Um, this is what's going on here. The form by which a person or thing strikes the vision, the external appearance, goes on to say, and then it goes on to talk about over here, then Philippians 2, 6, right? Philippians 2, 7, this whole passage, as I've shown more fully, blah, 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 with which compare the different view and it gives you different people's names, is to be explained as follows. Is to be explained as follows. So here we see Thayer, and we see here the lexicon, which can be read on Bible Hub. Uh, and this is also on Blue Letter that has this over here as well. So here, pertaining to Philippians 2, 6, who although, right, formerly when he was, he bore the form in which he appeared to the inhabitants of heaven of God, sovereign, sovereign. Goes on to say, yet did not think that this is equality with God was to be eagerly clung to or retained, but emptied himself of it so as to assume the form of a servant in that he became unto like unto men. And it goes on to say, was found in the fashion as a man. As a man, right? So here we see how this word can be understood, which is the word morphe. You go back up. This is the Greek word here, morphe. And this is what we're talking about, the word form here. It has, has the meaning of the form by which a person or thing strikes the vision, external appearance. Also, Strong's definition, morphe, though the idea of adjustment of parts, shape, figuratively, nature, form. So we're talking about here, who, who was Jesus by nature or form prior to his incarnation? As we just read a moment ago, what did we read? Who, although formerly when he was, bore the form in which he appeared to the inhabitants of what? The inhabitants of heaven. That, again, as we understand the context of Philippians 2, points to his pre-existence and form of God. He bore the form of God. You look at, take away the parentheses here for a second. He bore the form of God. Yet, he yet did not think of this equality with God was to be eagerly clung to or retained. We'll talk about that in a second here. So he had equality already prior to his incarnation, but it was something he didn't cling on to. We'll talk about that in a second here, right? But he emptied himself, and that word empty can also have the meaning of humbled himself to what? So as to assume the form of a servant, in that he became like unto men. So what do we see going on over here in these scriptures? What we see here, when you're looking at here, who although he existed, meaning he already was, he was in the presence of God, in the inhabitants thereof, he existed, he came forth from the Father, and he was in the form of God, morphe, nature of God. He did not regard equality with God, he didn't cling to it, something to be grasped. Let's look at what that word there here has to do with equality or the word emptied, okay? Actually, no, let's look at here. We're going to look at the word here. Sorry. Did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. So here's the word we're going to look at over here. Here's the word here. We'll say it out loud. Strong's G725. Harpagmas. 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 There we go. Got it? All right. So now we see this word here, the act of seizing, robbery, a thing seized or to be seized, um, a thing to be seized upon or held fast to retain, right? So here, 
when Paul is talking about Jesus, he says here, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. What is it? Why is that important? Because over here we see what's going on. A thing to be seized, to deem anything a prize, a thing to be seized upon, be held fast, retained. Philippians 2 6. On the meaning of this passage, see, blah, blah, blah. Now, the reason why this is important is because here we see how this word's being understood. Jesus did not cling to his status or his glory of recognition in the heavenly realm. What does that mean? Well, this is what's going on here. Remember, Paul says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was, past tense, also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as thing to grasp. Why? Why? Why did he not regard equality as a thing to grasp? Because he humbled himself. He emptied himself. Verse 7, taking the form of a bond servant. So when Jesus came, he came not with pride or arrogance or puffed upness or trying to toot any horns. He came in humility. He came in showing that he was a servant. He didn't cling to his glorified status that he had with the Father before his incarnation. Remember John 17, 5. He's talking to the Father. says, Father, glorify me together with the glory I had with you before the world was. Remember, in Revelation 1, when... John falls down at his feet and sees Jesus glorified. He falls down like a dead man. And Jesus picks him up. Says, I was dead. I'm alive forevermore. I'm the first. I'm the last. Right? Now Christ has been glorified. But when he comes into this world, for a time, he sets aside that glory, that recognition. Why? Because he emptied himself or humbled himself and became like you and me, became like a man in appearance, in our likeness. So this is why this is important. This is why the doctrine of the incarnation is so crucial. This is an essential Christian doctrine. If you deny the incarnation of Jesus Christ as being God come in the flesh, you are not a Christian. Now, it's one thing to not be understanding it, maybe be confused, but if you are outright denying this, as many heretics do, and false movements do, false teachers do, and you are not a Christian because you have a different Jesus. This is what we call scripturally, and we'll get to Hebrews 1 in a little bit, the hypostatic union, where Jesus is by nature or form being in the form of God came into this world, took on humanity, took on our likeness for a time, humbled himself, set aside his glory, but he was still God come in the flesh. Colossians 2, 9, Hebrews 1, 3, and other places. But his recognition and his glory was not here in the flesh, not like he has in the heavenly realm, not like what he had before his incarnation, not what we see in the book of Revelation. That's changed later, right? How he goes back and now he's glorified, right? This is important. This is important. So, when we're looking at this word over here, a thing to be grasped or seized upon. He didn't cling to it. He didn't cling to that. His status here and what it means, right? He didn't cling to it. He didn't hold fast and hold on to it. And here's another important word. Let's look at this word here. This is the word here. Of empty. So we didn't get he didn't grasp, then cling to it, and then he sucked. This is where the word we get the word empty. Okay. This is the word the word empty here. Or humble. Strong's G 2758. Kanao. Kanao. All right. 
There we go. You guys are getting some lessons out. I love it. So here, the word emptied. To make void, to make none effect, to make of what? No reputation. Why is that important? Because when Jesus came, he didn't come with glory. A host of angels, you know, all around him coming with flaming fire of, you know, swords. Jesus came this world as a baby. He came into this world as a baby. He became one of us, became like us, becoming a young man, then a man, showing humility, submissive himself, submitting himself to the Father by choice, pointing people to the Father, speaking the words of the Father, coming in the name of the Father, yet at times also claiming equality with the Father, doing signs and wonders claiming to pre-exist, claiming to be the eternal I am, claiming to be the one sent from the Father to come into this world. And he goes back to be with the Father where he was before. We see these things throughout Scripture, especially the Gospel of John. Here, to make empty, to have to make empty of Christ, he laid aside equality with or the form of God. Now, this is not saying he laid aside his deity, He's talking about when he came down, he wasn't going around shoving his authority around the people. He came and showed humility. But at times, we also see how Jesus did claim to have equality. Let's read this little note here and see what it says. The outline of biblical usage for Kenoho is taken directly from Thayer's Greek lexicon. The statement that Christ laid aside equality with it or former God is confusing and erroneous. This is, I agree. That's why I clarified what I said a second ago. If understood as the removal of Christ's divine nature, and that's, of course, not what we're teaching. Such interpretation is not supported here or elsewhere in Scripture. The text does not state that Christ emptied himself of anything, but rather he emptied himself by taking the form of a human and a servant to the point of death for our good and for our salvation. Amen and amen. Blue Letter Bible note. Beginning in Philippians 2, Paul sets forth Christ's as the consummate example of very kind of self selflessness to which he exhorts believers back to Philippians two verses three and four, which he himself exemplifies in two 17 when you keep on reading. So this is important. So it's a good note by blue letter Bible here to make void, to deprive or force to render useless of no effect to make void to cause a thing to be seen or empty, hollow, false. Goes on to say, Kenoso or Kenoho. To make empty, to abase, neutralize, falsify, make of none effect of no reputation once again. So this is important because some people will reject this statement. Some people will reject the claim that Christ actually came into this world, took on our likeness, took on humanity. And when it talks about him emptying himself or humbling himself, they will say, no, that can't mean that you Christians are making this stuff up. It's not to mind him taking any reputation. Yes, it is. Because he was already being in the presence of others, in the form of God. He was by nature God, and he didn't cling to his status as God equality, but he humbled himself, right? He didn't cling to it. And then it was like, ah, I'm going to come down in power and glory. But for a time, even though he's equal with the Father, he came to this world and humbled himself and showed us the perfect example of what it means to be a servant, what it means to be a follower. Now let's keep reading on here. To make empty, on, to make empty, blah, blah, blah. Let's see, Philippians 2.6.0. Now here it says, he laid aside equality with or the form of God. So again here, this is not completely accurate with laid aside his equality because he didn't lay aside. For a time, what he did is he put aside his glory, not his equality, but his glory, his recognition, his reputation of who he was by nature. So this is not completely accurate here. Now, goes on to say here, though, here, to make void, deprive force, to render vain, useless of no effect, to make void, cause a thing to be seen or unhealth, uh, false, other different ways this can be used. So in anything that you're saying here, 
right? Again, they even put it over here once again. This is really important. They put it again just to be very clear if you missed it the first time. That we as Christians, when we look at these words here, when it talks about he emptied himself, it doesn't mean that he set aside his deity. It means he set aside his equality, but it showed his humility that Christ came to this world, became like one of us, and showed us the perfect example of to be selfless and to put others first. Why? Because Christ died for the world. Christ paid the death for every person, period, right? He came to, because he loved us, he died for us, and he rose again. So this is when we're looking at Philippians 2. This is important to grasp. So not only do we see Jesus existing, past tense, in the form of God, the nature of God. So this is talking about Christ's pre-existence. Then we see Paul equating here, did not regard equality, this thing that he would cling to, this of reputation, something to grasp, but what? He emptied himself or humbled himself. How? How did he empty himself? How did he humble himself? By coming to this world, taking the form of a bondservant, and being being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, that's what we see in the incarnation. That's what we see in Christ's pre-existence, being with the Father, being by nature God, in heavenly realm with the heavens thereof and he came this world took on our flesh took on our likeness humbled himself being an example and not only that he went to the cross and died for you are you listening he died for you jehovah's witness he died for you unitarian he died for you mormon muslim jewish person atheist he died for you he wants you to truly trust in him as Lord, as Savior. The one who died upon the cross paid the debt that you could never pay through all what you think of good works, being a part of a certain denomination or organization or certain sect or whatever it may be. You can never do it on your own. Christ paid the price for you on the cross. Tell Telestai, debt paid in full. He loves you. He died for you. He came for you. He humbled himself for you. Will you put aside your pride, your so-called knowledge, and say, yes, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you did for me. Thank you that you died for me. Thank you that you rose again. I want to believe in you. I want to trust in you. It's not by my works, not by how much knowledge I got, how much study I do, but simply by grace. And I acknowledge it and I thank you and I trust in you as my Lord and Savior. And if you do that, you put your trust in the biblical Jesus, you will have eternal life. You will be set free and have a changed life forever. Amen and amen. Let's look at continuing on here. Now, Paul doesn't stop there, though. The next few verses are awesome. So we see Paul addressing the incarnation and... Jesus' crucifixion. Now we see Paul emphasizing his resurrection, his exaltation, his glorification, right? Verses 9, 10, and 11 state here, for this reason also, God, in the context here we know is talking about the Father, could you get down to verse 11, this is what we see. And many times when we see in Paul's epistles and salutations, he will normally say God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, showing distinction of persons and how he recognizes and how he writes his letters. But Jesus is by nature God, but Jesus is not God the Father. For this reason also, God, meaning the Father, highly exalted him. Who's the him? Jesus. Bestowed on him. Who's the him? Jesus. The name which is above every name. Think about that. Every name. Every name. Every name. Jesus has the highest name. Isn't that amazing? So that at the name of Jesus, 
Can we have any Pentecostals in that? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow of those who are on heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, this is a reference to Isaiah 45. Now, I want to focus on the last part here. Every tongue will confess. They will acknowledge. They will confess and know, they will know who Jesus Christ is. There are some people who believe this teaches universalism, that all will be saved. This is not at all what Paul teaches. This is not the context here, nor was it the context of Isaiah 45. What it's saying is every tongue will confess. Every tongue will acknowledge who Jesus Christ truly is. doesn't mean they're going to be saved here, but it means they will at least know who he truly is. So when you deny Christ, when you deny the deity of Christ, when you deny who he is, there will be a day where you will acknowledge that. Hopefully, not for eternal judgment and damnation for you rejecting who Jesus Christ truly is. I pray you repent of that. So here's what we see Paul stating, for this reason also God highly exalted him, I meaning talking about resurrected him, and we know that the Father's involved with the resurrection of Jesus, Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. We know that Jesus claimed that he would raise himself from the dead. John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. We know the Holy Spirit was involved with the resurrection of Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. 1 Peter 3, 18. Yet we know all three are involved. Bestowed upon him the name which every name is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Let's go to Isaiah 45, and let's see where Paul is referencing here. Let's start in verse 21. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord, and there is no other God besides me? Amen and amen. There is only one God. And that one God has been revealed, as Scripture teaches, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A righteous God and Savior. There is none except me. Now watch here. This is the direct quote, what Paul is quoting from Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11 here. Turn to me and be saved, verse 22 of Isaiah 45. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. Who's speaking? For I am God, and there is no other. I have sworn by myself the words gone forth from my mountain in righteousness and will not turn back. That to me, who's the me? I am God, that to me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear or confess. This is being addressed by the Apostle Paul to Jesus. This is what we see over here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. Paul ascribes this here, this quote, to Jesus. Once again, showing the equality that Jesus has with the Father. That he is Lord. That he is God. One with the Father. Like John 10, 30 says, I and the Father are one. Literally in the Greek, we are one in John 10, 30. They are one. One of the same substance, one of the same nature, authority, and equality. So when we look at Philippians 2, this shows and demonstrates who Christ was prior to his taking on flesh, prior to his incarnation, and then the purpose. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came because he loves you. Jesus came to what? Humble himself. 
Jesus came and took on our likeness, became like one of us. He had physical limitations. And he grew, as the Bible says in Hebrews 5, grew in knowledge and understanding by submitting himself to the Father. Though he was fully God come in the flesh, meaning that he was by nature God, for a time he by choice, by choice, humbled himself and took on humanity and had limitations. But at times we see how he claimed to forgive, to heal, to have equality with the Father at times. He claimed to be the eternal I am, John 8, 58. He claimed I am the Father. One says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, showing that he is God come in the flesh, but he's not the Father. We see how he also, when he's resurrected, appears to Thomas. And Thomas says to him, my Lord, my God. Jesus doesn't correct him. He says, because you've seen me, have you believed? More blessed, you brothers and sisters listening now, who do believe in who Christ truly is. Amen.